Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are doing our seventh, seventh podcast, seventh podcast, and actually this one's coming in two days after our last one, uh, double banger this week. We have a very, 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 very special guest uh, this week. This is Dr. J. You've heard us talk about him. He is absolutely incredible. Uh, he has a lot of knowledge in in the the, the mental aspect of, of all this stuff, and we're gonna. I want to pick his brain. We're gonna pick his brain. We want to hear all, uh, learn all about it, get to know it. But before we get to Dr. J, because because I, I, we have a lot to say to you. You guys already know WT. I want to say what's up, WT. How you doing, baby? Good. How you guys doing today? Uh, looking forward to this. I got my pen, oh, my paper for notes because I plan on opening up my ears and uh, just absorbing any information I can. Uh, I did a, just a little bit of research. I didn't want to go too far and give this guy uh, Dr. J stalker vibes, but uh, <laughs> he's very impressive. He uh, he does a lot. He's got a lot of like written pieces out there he's got his own podcast and uh yeah i've been i've been stoked about this for two weeks so i'm ready to go absolutely and i love that you have your pen and paper because i'm we're old school we're old school you know my stream (laughs) always makes fun of me because i all the notes i take are always pen and paper and they're like dude just use that use your computer use use notes yeah look we're see we're old school we're old school so uh wt it's always good to hear you doing well and i'm i'm super excited as well Dr. J, the man, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, I first of all, I want to say thank you for coming on, uh, coming on the on the podcast. I thank think you this for is having me. Absolutely incredible. I think, uh, like like uh, WT said, I think your resume is very, very, very impressive. Now, I have some questions for you. I'm going to pick your brain. I have my pen and paper ready as well. Uh, I want to know what's your background and why did you get involved in NFTs um, in the first place. I will answer that. I have a question for you guys first, which is, do you have a name yet? The people want to know, what's the show called? We have a list. Do we have one yet? Did we pick it yet? We didn't pick it yet. No, we we got the list. Uh, I actually forwarded it over to uh, Bruno early this morning. uh, It's a big list. And there's a couple (laughs) on there I like. And yeah, uh, yeah, we haven't figured it out yet. We're we're still working on that. Yeah, there's there is a few really good ones. It's a big list. There's a lot of names you got to go through, but there's a few really really good ones. Um, yeah, we definitely got to pick. We got to pick that. We got to pick that. We got to pick that. Mm-hmm. But yes, uh, thank you for asking. But no, we haven't got that far yet. Uh, to ask the people want to know, and also I submitted one, so you know. Oh, let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah, Don't yeah. tell us which one. Maybe it's the one, but maybe we'll I'm pick not that one. Bias you. I can't, all right. I can't all right. All right. Yeah. I think I, I think I remember which one it was actually. Oh, but right. we'll see. He's we'll tainted see. now. We'll see. see now we. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah, tell us about yourself. Why did you get into this uh, NFT space? What do you What are your thoughts on it? I want. I'd love to hear uh, why you got involved and what's going on with your background and everything. Yeah, awesome. So I'm a I'm a marketing academic down here in uh, in Melbourne, Australia, at a, at a uni it's called Swinburne University of Technology, and and my background is sort of is from psychology, right? So I've always been a consumer researcher. Uh, I worked as a like a commercial consultant in some marketing research consultancy firms, and then switched over to academia because. I found it really provided a lot of freedom to just dive into topics that I was interested in versus working for your corporate clients, where if they didn't see, you know, potentially immediate sales increases from whatever it was, they didn't care, right? They were happy for someone else to explore it and and pick it up later. Mm -hmm. And so that ability to dive into a new topic and explore and just ask big questions and not necessarily have to come out with huge answers immediately, just explore like really appealed to me, particularly in the, with the psychologi- uh, psychologist right. in me. And so the cool thing about, about Swinburne, the whole mission at the moment is around people and technology working together for a better world, which I think sort of sounds pretty cool and is, is pretty timely, right? Yeah, yeah um, especially in these de- times for sure, for sure. Right, and yeah. I think we need it, right? Like technology is not going away, mm-hmm. right? So we need to work out how to live with it. How do we make it the best for us as humans? right? And people and how do we work together with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have a group here that I co-lead. It's called uh, CXI, Customer Experience and Insight. And everything we do is about trying to understand how consumers or people um, experience and behave with emerging technologies, right? So got some PhD students who have worked a lot in, in areas like augmented reality and retail, right? So if you're a traditional shopper, and then you walk into a, your mall or your shopping center and suddenly there's this virtual mirror where you're seeing a 3D version of yourself mm-hmm. trying on stuff. How does that affect you? Right. Because right. some people will love it. Some people will hate it. They'll run away, right? So mm-hmm. a lot of it, what we're doing is trying to find out how people experience those new technologies, how they get accepted, how they get used, right? So, and so, 
sorry go no ahead. no no go ahead because i i well i want to say i remember when i before i didn't want to interrupt you but before i remember when i uh when i was growing up i remember the big thing was one day you're gonna be able to buy clothes from your house you're not gonna have to leave that was a dream that was a dream back then this stuff didn't exist now people don't even leave their house to get groceries or or you know amazon d- delivers to your day their door the next day so uh it's funny you're saying that now the next step is the augmented reality because i remember when i was a kid the whole you you could buy clothes from your home that was like a oh yeah okay that's that's futuristic but that's that's today that's just that's reality today so i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you uh keep going i'm sorry my friend please please interrupt me right no no go ahead. Just, uh, you know i could i can get into lecturer mode and just start uh, rambling on for two hours uh, i i'm in listen. i'm in listener mode because i'm just so intrigued with everything you have to say so please go ahead i'm sorry go ahead <laughs> but so that example right is i think is a really good one so actually did Um, some work early on when sort of e-commerce was picking up. And really the question was, are people ever going to buy this stuff online, right? Mm -hmm. And, And early on, the assumption was people will never buy clothes online. You have to try them on. You have to see how they look. And of course, we know that's now wrong, right? So, so much of, of clothing purchases are made online. And I actually use that as an example of why I'm so interested in this NFT crypto space, NFT gaming, because I think if you, you look at the potential benefits to consumers, I think they're the same as being able to buy clothes online, right? There's some really potential benefits that potentially are not currently realized. And so a lot of the detractors are looking at how the thing currently is now and saying that'll never be a thing, Mm -hmm. right? Gamers will never get into NFTs because they're not into microtransactions and they're worried about pay, you know, pay to win. And I look at that and say, but that's based on how the current offerings are right now. Let's look at where things are going to be in five, 10 years from now as the technology, which is in its absolute infancy, evolves. And let's think about what is the potential? How could it impact us? Not today, necessarily, not next week, five, 10 years from now. And I see some really interesting applications for where this technology, you know, of, of the blockchain, NFT, all this kind of stuff could be. So for me, it's like a perfect opportunity to get in on the ground floor of something that's evolving. And you want to talk about seeing how people engage with an emerging technology. What's more emerging than NFTs? I 100% agree. Like actually, uh, gaming. WT, you were in my stream. It was yesterday the day before. Remember when I was having that conversation with that person in my stream and they were saying NFTs, no way. Were you there for that one? I don't know if you were in the stream when that happened. Yeah, I was. I was chiming in a little bit. Yeah. So uh, just at least give him something to think about right yeah you're absolutely right and i'm trying to tell them listen and i showed them a clip there's this clip you can find on the internet put bill gates and david letterman okay and literally i showed this person the clip because it's like listen to me man it's it's when bill gates was trying to explain the internet to to david letterman and 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 everyone watching on tv they were laughing at him saying and Bill Gates, and then he, so uh, David Letterman's like, "Well, what are you going to do on this internet? This, what is this going to be able to do?" And he says, "Well, you know, you can watch horse races or you know whatever you're into." And then uh, David Letterman's like, "Well, I sub to these horse racing magazines. I have it at my home. Why do I need this thing?" And he's like, "Okay, well, uh, you can watch a, uh, you can listen to a baseball game if you want it." And David Letterman's like, "Well, have you ever heard of a radio?" And it's like, so he kept, he was just too ignorant to accept that. Listen, this could be the future. This is the next phase. And where we're going, as as if you like it or not, as a society, as the world, we're going into the internet fa- world. If you like it or not, sure, you can read books, you can read magazines, but in re- in in reality. You know, I remember when I was a kid studying for, you know, school or whatever, I had to have the encyclopedia, the hard b- book in my hand. I just find, you know, E, I'm looking for a certain country. I have to look, okay, E, okay, I had to look it up and read it and highlight things. Today, you just go in your computer and you you highlight, you know, you're, you have all the information right there. So what I'm, so I hear what you're saying and I totally agree. We're on the ground floor for NFTs and crypto and all that. And whenever, whenever I think of, you know, when people try to say, oh, this stuff is going nowhere, it's like, listen, we're going to move, the world's going to go ahead with or without you. And And I always go back to that Bill Gates and David Letterman clip. When David Letterman's laughing about this internet and how is this going to be a thing, we have magazines that we're going to get our information from. We have, you know, who's going to need that stuff? So I always go back to that. And I agree with you. I think right now we're at that phase where people are still saying, listen, this is what's coming. Be ready for it. And there's always the naysayers going, ah, you know, I have have this. I don't need that. It's never going to go anywhere. So we're at that phase where it's like, 
people are starting to believe it and people are definitely, you know, still need, I don't want to say convincing, but they're not there yet, you know, acceptance. So, um, I didn't want to cut you off again. I'm sorry. I just got, I'm really into this, man. You're doing it. You know, I, I love this. I love these kind of conversations and I, I have my own thoughts on it as well. So I love that. Um, so yeah, so, uh, that was a really good answer by the way, everything you said there. Uh, did you want to touch anything up on that WT? Do you want to? Yeah, I got a quick question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, clearly you are, got extensive training and all this and i'm just grasping at straws a lot of times i did a video a while ago and i was talking about how we're pioneers in this and it, a lot of this reminds me of back then uh, long long ago when the pioneers went out west in the the usa they didn't all go in a mass herd out that way it was only some of them it was only some of them the the, the brave the bold the wanting to look for opportunity and is there some form of psychology of like almost like a mass herd where they're afraid and they'll only move if the mass herd moves? Uh, we've seen a lot of that in the last couple of years with everything going on. And uh, that that's that's some of my thoughts. I mean, it's like people are afraid to take risks. People are afraid of change. They're afraid of getting hurt. And they kind of close off to all the possibilities. And not not even trying it. Just at just sit there and think about it for a second. Instead, they just dismiss it really quick well what's your thoughts on that yeah so um i'll say on that uh wt when you say you grasp me at straws like I've, I've, I've i'm a fan right so i've listened to the last few podcasts and and pretty much everything you say is pretty on point and there's usually some backing to it even if you don't know that it's there or not you're if it's intuition alone you're doing really well because what you're talking about right there is called the diffusion of innovation right and so this is a, a really long lasting uh, well-researched and used sort of theory and model of how a new idea, right? How a new technology, how a new product disperses across a community, right? So it goes from a point where nobody knows what it is, mm -hmm. right? And then it's invented and then it's adopted and then it hits some tipping point where suddenly now everybody has it and it, it self-sustains itself, right? We talk about this, this idea of self-sustaining innovation, Right. And so what you're talking about is where we are with NFTs, crypto, Guild of Guardians, all of those sort of things. We're right at this beginning, really early phase, which we call the innovators and then the early adopters. Right. So we know from history and from looking at all of these different innovations, what it takes for an innovation to get to that tipping point. Right. It's the innovation itself. Right. So it has to be something that it, like we were talking about, has some benefit, it's going to end up being used and it has to evolve over time, right? It needs adopters. So it needs people who are actually going to get in uh, and use it. It needs communication channels. So it needs a way for those adopters, right? So the people who are in it, right, know about it and are using it to talk to other people, right. talk to each other, and then also talk to non adopters. Like on right? boards. And then it's exactly, and then it just needs time right? Because this, this stuff takes a while, right? So WT, what you're talking about is that individuals for any different innovation will sit somewhere different on that curve, right? Without wanting to get into hardcore stats and maths, if we can ever remember the, the bell curve or that what we call the normal distribution, right? So it sort of does this kind of thing. People are dispersed along that curve, which essentially uh, sort of describes where in that stage they're likely to pick it up. Right. So you have innovators, which are the people right at the start of something that are creating something new, right? Creating new value. So if you think about this, this is the people who are building, you know, NFT projects. This is like, you know, the Guild of Guardians team and possibly some of the really early ambassadors. There's really early adopters who are taking it and building something on top of whatever that innovation is. Right. Then you have the early adopters, right? And this is all of the people who are currently in the space doing something, right? For a project to get into that tipping point, it's got to go from what we call the early majority to the late majority, right? So at some point for a for a innovation to be sustainable, you need your average person, the mass market, right? The average community to, to get on board. There are not enough innovators and early adopters, mm -hmm. right? in a community to make something sustainable. We need the people like you're talking about who are sort of the followers, right? That aren't willing to take the risk, right? Aren't willing to jump in early and need it to be sort of already very well formed right. to get on board. Cause that's where most people sit. That's that fat middle yep. of that 
innovation curve. With right? the least amount so of risk, I guess, because the, the early in investors and stuff, they're the ones risking everything. And then once people see it's established, yeah. that's when they're like, okay, well, this is the real deal kind of things that you're trying to say. Exactly. So right. innovators and early adopters, right? What sort of characterizes those people is that they're, they're risk takers, right? They're innovative as the name uh, sort of sort of says, but they've got some sort of skill or ability that they're able to look at something, assess it and say, yes, this is worth being part of, right? I can tell the difference between something that's not built, right? Let's, let's be honest. Like if we're talking about Guild of Guardians, talking about a lot of stuff, it's not, oh, it's 80% build. It's 60% build as WT said, right? But it's, we can't play it. I don't know. I have no way of knowing, right? If it's actually a good game. I right. think it will be, right? Right. But we have no idea. Right. But here we all are investing in it, playing in it, whatever, because we think we've got some ability to look at it and go, all right, that one looks good. And those 10 other ones that are out there just sort of talk and make a noise don't look so good. And that's why I'm in this one and not that one, right? Mm -hmm. For your average person, your early and late majority, they don't want to do that, right? They don't, they don't have the time or the effort or the skills or the risk-taking sort of personality to want to do that. They want Fully formed game, here it is. It already has X hundreds of thousands or millions of users. It already has all these reviews. It has all these component WT, you know, podcasts and streams and guides. And we're going to hold your hand through it, get in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's exactly what you're talking about. And I was going to bring that up later when we're talking about the, the GOG delay. Because I 100%, no, 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 this is good. I 100% yeah. uh, agree with that that totally totally on the same page as you that's the thing is people want the brand fully there before they can't see they can't see ahead they just see kind of what's there okay oh the brand's built now i'm coming in where there's people like you know i don't want to say myself but there's people that are there that's like i see the potential i see where this can go and i want to get in now and that's that's i told your man i like i like your brand i like how you think man i like it i like it uh so that so that's so what appealed to you about guild of guardians then what what got you into guild of guardians what what, what appealed uh to you about it what was it why yeah, guild so, of guardians uh, so as i was saying before right so i'm like sort of in this space where i'm trying to learn about emerging technologies how consumers sort of interact with them right so I'm, you know, going about my day job, I'm teaching my classes and doing all this stuff. And I keep seeing all of these sort of presentations, these trend reports, there's all this stuff about crypto, about NFT, about, you know, at that point, play to earn gaming, all this kind of stuff popping up. And I'm sitting there being like, I'm a total fraud, right? Like I'm talking about being in emerging technologies and, you know, I know all about this stuff and I have absolutely no exposure to this sort of whole space of crypto NFTs, blah, right? Because honestly, I just did not have the time to dive into it well enough, right? right. One thing I've learned really early on this is, you know, this the whole idea of do your own research, you know, invest the time in, right? Because I saw so many people, they're like, I'm just going to buy whatever because so-and-so says so. And that's the thing where the rug gets pulled and, and they've lost all their money, right? I'm like, yep. I do not want that, right? Like, I'm up for experimenting and taking some risks, but I'm not risking, you know, my income and my house or anything meaningful to me on something I don't understand. 100%. Right? Like, I need to know about this before I do anything meaningful. Right. Right. So uh, good timing where towards the end of the year from December through February, I've been on leave, right? So I had uh, excess annual leave in December, January, February, I had the opportunity to be primary carer for my 10 month old daughter, right? So I had three months sitting there on my, I'm not at work. Like I'm parenting, that is a right. job in and of itself, right? I'm with you on that. But yep. there's going to be times where naps are happening or, you know, I'm lying on the couch doing whatever. I'm like, that is the time. I'm just going to get my phone out. I'm just going to dive into NFT Twitter. I'm going to go through, you know, any articles I can find about. I'm going to explore it, right? I'm going to get into it. And so quickly I sort of found this idea of like, what I would call different types of NFT projects, right? And so you've got the ones where it's sort of the, it's the status symbol profile picture, right? We know what ones they are, where yep. it's all about just owning that thing is what That's it is. Status, right? It's right? like, yeah. it's, it's rare, it's whatever, yep. and you're in the club, yeah. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff has never personally appealed to me, right? I've never, I've never, wanted something just purely because other people have wanted it, right? And again, it comes back to that psychology and we can talk about this idea of what value really means, right? And I, so I kept looking for things. I'm like, I wanted to do something. 
Like I want to own something that has what I see as value or we might call it utility, right? So I'm looking around, I'm like, okay, if I get this one, then I, I'm sort of in a, I can join the private discord and talk to some other people that own it. You know, that's cool, I guess, but what community do I want to be part of, right? And that's what led me to this, this whole of, at that point, play to earn gaming. And then obviously with, with Guild of Guardians, this idea of play and earn, right? Right. And so once I discover this whole idea of, well, NFTs could be part of gaming, I'm a, I'm a long-term gamer, right? So I'm like, well, that appeals to me immediately, right? That's combining two things I enjoy as hobbies. Let's, let's put them together. And then I joined a few. And, and honestly, like the, the Guild of Guardians, Discord was one of the most active and welcoming ones that I found, mm-hmm. right? So Agreed. I joined in and I'm like, hey, I'm a complete newbie to the whole space, right? I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I want to buy a hero and I, I've tried to buy money on an exchange and now I can't get it into this other thing called token something. And <laughs> wh- why am I getting paid? Why am I paying $30 in fee? You know, right, I'm right. asking all of these newbie questions. Right. And people were so helpful, like absolutely so helpful. And I ended up like, because I did it the wrong way, I had like $3, not enough to buy a hero. Oh no. The user's like, <laughs> send me your thing and I'll send it oh, to you. I'm awesome. like, what? Are, why are you sending me free money, right? Cool. Um, yeah, that's shout, cool. shout out Big Wise, right? Yeah, oh, um, shout out Big Wise. There you go. That is awesome. awesome. That is awesome. I'm like, all right, here's this community, mm-hmm. right? Of people who are into NFTs, they're gamers. It's a fantasy RPG and they seem pretty welcoming. I'm good. I'm in. Yeah. Right. That's that's massive. Um, Community is absolutely massive in any any space, period. And it's it's funny you say that because I I feel like the crypto people in crypto are some of the most generous people. I had the same problem happen to me where I didn't have uh, it was on another game and I didn't have Matic. I didn't have any Matic and I needed like literally nothing, but it I needed that little bit just to make the exchange. The guy's like, just give me your wallet, I'll send you something. You know what I mean? It's just like people are just so quick to help and i love that i love that about and i you know i try to pay it forward as well so it's like everyone's kind of in to to help each other in a way and i kind of like that it's like it's something like that where it's like you you're asking questions i don't know what i'm doing but he's like don't worry i got you you know what i mean i'll help you out and and i see that so many especially in the guild of guardians community i see that a lot especially in this one and this is part of that diffusion of innovation idea as well right because i think when you think about those early adopters the people who are in something early it is to all of our benefit if this is a success for everyone, right? Mm-hmm. Right? Because, uh, and I think the, the Guild of Guardians team has sort of done a good job of, of describing this. It's like the biggest benefit to us, right? I'm going to say us, like I have, uh, I have five heroes and two pets or something. We're in the and same I, boat. I won those yeah. two pets. <laughs> I won those two pets in competitions, right? Nice. So I'm not, as, I'm not as heavily invested as, you know, the whales, right? But guy, us is, as... Okay, WT. <laughs> <laughs> us as early adopters right people who are holding yeah. it now when there's no game right absolutely the biggest benefit to us is when the tens of millions of people are playing the game in three four years mm-hmm. right like any price changes that happen now increases decreases whatever honestly are going to be minuscule in comparison right. to if you're early and, and, a, and a founder of something that becomes massive, like the team wants it to be, yeah. right? We know from that diffusion of innovation idea, that is when those people, those early adopters benefit the most. Right. right? And so I think the people who are truly in it for the long run understand that, whether it, they you know, know it consciously or just inherently that we are all invested in this thing turning out well. So working together, helping each other, supporting each other is to everybody's benefit, right? 100%. Because I had such a good experience and I got my one hero, right? Then I'm like hanging around. Suddenly, you know, there's some competitions. I find this O Canada Guild, shout out Tomahawk, right? He's so got a competition. I get involved. He messages me like, hey, if you want to come hang out in our guild, you can. So I do. Suddenly I go from one hero. Then I'm like, you know what? I think I need to be more in. Now I've got five, right? That's good for the whole community. Yeah. Right. Everybody benefits from me, you know, being in this rather than something else. And for every me, there's 10, 20, 100, hopefully millions coming. Right. Right. And and that's, I think that's where we're headed. I agree. And I think it's like when, when you say like, we all need to help build each other. I'm always trying to, you know, help out with other podcasts and, you know, even sharing their content, retweeting, liking, commenting, you know, sharing these videos, get like bringing people in these. I want, 
every like you say for every person that i know i'm getting it out to the people that i know and then you know wt knows some people they're watching the video you know some people they're watching some video and it just spreads and uh we're just trying to get the name out i like i truly 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 i can't say enough i truly believe in this project and like you say i'm in it for the long haul and i understand too it's like what the the prices that are happening today are just irrelevant i mean they're they're relevant but they're irrelevant long term when this and, we, and WT and I talk about this all the time. When, when there's a launch date, uh, these prices, what you see today, are going to be nowhere near what it's going to be like down the road. And, you know, it's like, again, like you see, it's people that, that can see. It's not, they're not looking at today and tomorrow. They're looking at, you know, six months, five months, a year, five years down the road. And that's everything I do in the crypto space. I always look, I always say five years in, in event. I always say five years. That's the number I always give myself is five years. Um, that's really, I love your explanations. They're so detailed and you know exactly what you're talking about. And I love it because I have a very similar view on how you see things in the way that I, I completely, 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 completely understand what you're saying. Uh, WT, what do you think of this? Um, listen to everything he said and all that, uh, this, this so reminds me of early 2013 with just crypto itself. Uh, the big buzzword back then was ICOs. Everybody wanted to get in ICOs. That was the big buzzword. Mm -hmm. You get in early, you get the pump, you get out. And while this is not the same, it does remind me of it being very similar. And for me personally, I want to know the whole package of what i'm getting into uh from where do they come from where do they get their money from where's their team from and make my decisions based upon that and we have a lot of people in this space that are here just for the money let's let's be honest that's it's yeah. part of the nature of the beast and hey we need them because we need that liquidity if we didn't have liquidity this ain't going nowhere we need we need that fuel to get up and going so a lot of people are here just for the money and it's up to us to kind of like Capone said, get that word out and convert people to like, hey, yes, this is a little dangerous, but there is some opportunities and some cool stuff that is coming and it's emerging. Because from 2017 to now, I, I took a two year break and I'm kicking myself for it. But uh, what what was going on in 2017 is not anywhere close now. It is evolved and it's just yeah. going to keep evolving. And that's that's how I feel about it. That that actually leads me to my next uh, question. I wanted to ask you is like, what have you noticed about the consumer behavior and psychology around this entire space? Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's something. You know, what what, yeah. what do you see on it? What are your what are your thoughts on that? On the on the behavior and psychology around this space? So there's a lot. One quickly that I'll touch on because I think it's been talked about a lot. Then I want to follow up on a point you guys both just made it is around this idea of FOMO, right? So I think it's a, it's a, you know, fear of missing out where it's, you know, talked about a lot. It's, it's given as a reason, you know, I FOMO'd into whatever, like that's a sort of common term around NFTs and crypto. We know that, that FOMO is actually a, a legitimate thing, right? So it's, it's now been studied, it's been defined, it can be measured. It's, it's, it's in academic sort of peer reviewed um, journals. It, it's interesting because FOMO comes from, our sort of inbuilt survival instincts and this idea of scarcity, right? Where if, for example, you know, I live somewhere where there's not a lot of clean drinking water, I need it to survive, right? And so when some is available, I'm going to put everything I can into getting that water because I need it. I literally need it to live, right? And so what is what happens and what a lot of businesses do, we see this with a lot of sort of limited time sales or exclusive offers, whatever, whatever, is they play on that inbuilt sort of feeling that we have, which is this thing is scarce. Yeah. Therefore, mm. I must want it. I must need it, right? Scarce things must be valuable because there's scarce, right? right? That's how our, our sort of brains are wired, right, is, is to do that. And so that's why we feel that FOMO. Right. right. Um, in, a, in a lot of cases, it, you know, it can be like, I feel it too, right? Like I had exactly the same thing where it's like, I don't want to miss out on all my heroes where I can afford them now. Cause what if they double next month? Right. And of course they didn't. Right. That's but happened to me too. That's yeah. the bit where the challenge is we need to sort of acknowledge and understand why we feel that FOMO is that we think that scarce things are valuable. Right. And we really need to sort of, I guess, as individual people question whether, uh, it is truly scarce or whether it is actually going to be make or break if I'm in it now versus later. That's something I see. Right. And it links to the second idea, which, which you guys were just talking about, which is sort of really fundamental to my whole area around consumer behavior, consumer psychology and marketing, which is the difference between price and value, 
right? I got into some debates with people in, in the Guild of Guardians discourse of saying like, the prices don't matter. And, and I, that's an oversimplification, right? Because they do, and they do to all the flippers, they do to all the liquidity, they do to new people coming in. Prices do matter, but what matters much more in the, in the global scheme and for consumer behavior, consumer psychology is this idea of value, right? Um, so if I can go back to sort of uh, intro marketing kind of stuff, Price is what you pay for something, right? Is there's the, the financial sacrifice that you give up? So that's basic, right? We get that. Value is actually a much broader abstract idea, which is much harder to define, but basically sort of comes down to this idea of a trade-off between the benefits you get from something and the sacrifices you have to give up for whatever that thing is, right? Now, price is one of those sacrifices that you have to give up for something, right? Mm. But there's also time, there's effort, there's emotional energy, there's opportunity cost of being in one thing over another thing, right? So there's yep. many actual kinds of sacrifices that we give up as consumers all the time when we make a choice. We buy one brand over another. It costs us money, right? right. That is a sacrifice. But there's also then sort of the sometimes that stress of did I make the right decision or not or you know, all those yeah. other sacrifices we have yep. to give up, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Now, the benefits, right, again, are multifaceted, right? There is the utilitarian, like, functional benefit as what does the thing do, right? And so in the NFT space, we talk about that as the utility, right? But there are also many other potential benefits. There's sort of self-esteem, right? You just feel good about yourself because you have it, right? Mm -hmm. So... Like my, like I, I'm a bit of a basketball fan, Dr. J, right? After Julie serving Dr. J, right? So I've got a bunch of, you know, Jordans. I think they look good. They, they don't function any differently <laughs> from any other shoe right. that I own, but they have a self-esteem benefit to me, right? right? To me, individually, they have a benefit that other people wouldn't realize yeah. because yeah. it's how they make me feel right. internally, right? Then there's also sort of social and relational potential benefits. This is where the community comes in, right? And so what are you part of by, by having that thing, right? And so this is where, you know, as, as WT has talked about it and has done actually a really good job in the discords sort of talking people to about this is like, think about what you're here for. What are the benefits that you are going to get from a potential project, right? If that is just about flipping based on price, then all good luck to you, right? But that's going to be always very challenging. Some people will get lucky, some will not. That is the nature of flipping right. by price, right? Someone has to win, someone has to lose, right? If, if I sell to you and I've made a profit, you've lost out unless you can sell to somebody else. That's right. right? right. If you focus purely on price. If we focus on value, right? And we think about, and, and we each think, what is the value I get of owning this thing? To me, right? And again, this is, I should say all of this is not financial advice, right? I'm not an economist. Right. I'm not a financial person. I just know a little bit about how we think, right? Of to me, the value of owning Guild of Guardians heroes, right, goes way beyond what they're going to be able to do for me in this game that is not yet out, mm -hmm. right? It's, I feel good about being, you know, a marketing academic who people think like live in sort of an ivory tower, have, you know, stuffy old people, whatever that I own an NFT in a crypto game. I mean, that's right. just cool. I just, I just like that, right? I like that my friends know that I own an uh, oh, yeah. anything, right? All my friends know now. And, that's, and, and it's funny you say, like for me, the value is the community. I've always been a community-based person. Like that's something huge for me. And owning these, these NFTs and the, and the Guild of Guardians, being part of the community, that holds value to me. That's what I enjoy, being part of the community, getting to know the community members, everybody. You know, if it's someone that just joined in today or it's been there for months, you know, just I love getting to know the community and being a part of it and help building it. Uh, so that brings value to me, just going back on your point, you know? It, exactly. And this is the thing where then that value is so much more than the prices, right? But it's also so subjective. Some people will not get any benefit from the community. They don't care about it, right? They're yeah. just purely utilitarian people. And that's also fine, right? But for each of us sort of individually, it's about what is the value. So this goes back to then when the, with the delay with Guild of Guardians, right? Of like, to me, that only changed the value of this ownership very, a very minute amount, right? Like I would have loved to play the game in a couple of months time. Now I'm playing it in a few months time, right? Or a bit later than that. So 
that value in terms of the gaming utilitarian aspect of it, you know, decreased a tiny bit, but not 50%, not, not what we've seen right. reflected in, you know, WT's pricing updates, right? right? So and that tells me that a lot of people either haven't seen, experienced, or don't personally feel that value of being part of an early community hearing about the game's development plans, right? Like that to me is something cool too. Like seeing these leaks, I like that I could be there and be like, wait to see if one of my heroes gets leaked and be like, I remember seeing the first ever right. you know, leak of this hero's ability, right? Right. Being able to participate in competitions in some of the guilds, right? So I'm, I'm part of the O Canada Guild. I'm not from Canada, right? <laughs> I'm Australian, yep. right? Very far from Canada. I'd love to move to Canada one day, but again, <laughs> such a welcoming community, right? That are doing quite a lot and shout out to Tomahawk doing uh, those competitions. And, you know, so we were able to write a backstory for the heroes that we chose, right? That to me is, is cool. I just enjoy that, right? That is value to me from owning those, those NFTs. Maybe others don't feel that, but if we each individually think about what is the value that this thing has to me, then changes in prices won't actually affect us very much because Price is only one small part of that value equation. Right, and, and the value, and, and like basically what you're saying, it's like the value is your joy, your happiness. This It brings you happiness being a part of this. That's more valuable than whatever price or whatever it is. is you're, you're putting, you're giving yourself, um, you know, happiness or joy or whatever it is. I like that. I like that a lot. And that's, I was actually going to ask you the pros and cons. What are the pros and cons of this delay, I, I feel like the ones that you said, the prices dropped and everything like that. I feel like uh, it almost feels, I don't want to say we got rid of the early investors because you need them and I don't want to get rid of them. It's something like that. But it's like, I think it, it uh, the people that were here for the short term, it was like, like all right, well, I, you know, and, and some people just financially can't stick in, uh, stay in, which is, you know, you can't blame them. But I think a lot of them will be back once things kind of pick up. But yeah, what are the pros and cons to the delay? What what's What are the pros? What are the cons? Yeah, so I actually dived into some of the some some research about this. Um, there's been some academic studies that have sort of tracked different uh, sort of product launches and when they get delayed, what happens, right? And I think sort of not surprisingly, there's there's always sort of a, a short term hit, right? So there's a hit to the company, mm -hmm. there's a hit to sort of the consumer base, right? There's a little bit of um, sort of some loss of trust, some customers leave. There's always sort of this sort of initial turmoil, right? And that's to be expected. Yep. And, and the reason that happens is what we call expectation disconfirmation, right? Which is a fancy word for saying reality doesn't live up to your expectations, right? And so the what matters there is the difference between what you expect is going to happen and, and what really happens, right? So if the people who were um, flipping, right, had bought for profits and were expecting an alpha in two weeks time and expecting that price bump from the alpha and expecting that that would allow them to sell at three, four, five times profit so they could take mm. that and invest in something else, right? Their reality is very different right. from <laughs> what they're now experiencing, right? Yeah. That hurts, that really hurts, right? Because when, our, when reality doesn't live up to expectations, we essentially have to question why, right? Because we like to think that we are all smart, rational beings. We like to think that we, you know, have good beliefs about the world and we're able to plan and expect what's going to happen, right? Because if we just lived in pure chaos, that would suck, right? <laughs> so when our expectations are not met and they're not met by a really big distance, we have to question why, right? Was I wrong? Did I misinterpret, misread something, right? And I have to just cop that myself. That's hard, right? That, that's a lot to take. Right. And, and I'm not saying those people did do that, but it's, I'm saying it, that's the right. mental process we have to go through. Why did this happen? Right. So it's either I made, I was expecting the wrong thing or someone else told me the wrong thing. Yeah, or here's this like, other reason. Right. right. So that's the challenge that we start seeing. And I think this is why we saw um, and, and we would expect to see with delays like that, that initial sort of really emotional response from a lot of people saying, you know, I was lied to, like, this is, you know, all this kind of stuff right. that was happening because of that expectation disconfirmation, yeah. right? Yeah. For other people we saw, and I think a lot of people said, like, I expected it to be delayed, mm -hmm. right? Games get delayed all the time, right? Like, if, if you are in, in a gaming space, like, we've seen some really massive, and I think you guys even talked about this, 
right? We saw cyberpunk yep. not get delayed and suck. Yeah. And and how impactful that was. Yeah, destroyed right? the game. Killed it. Just destroyed it, right? Yep. I was so excited, yep. right? And and I I played it and it was fine. It would have been a great game, but I could not get out of my head, right? Oh, everyone's saying this is buggy, and now I'm looking for bugs, right. even if they're not there. It's the it's right? the cycle, it's the mental for problems. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. We right. see the opposite of this, right? With Halo Infinite, I'm an I'm an like long term Xbox guy. Um, and we'll have to get some games. It, we'll have to get some games in your had, name. Had had a sort of trailer where people are like, "Wait, this is a next generation game. This is not ready." People are like, "We know it's not ready, right? It's still mm -hmm. a year, whatever." They end up delaying it. Same thing happens. People are like, oh, "I'm never buying an Xbox." Like the only game that's good on it, it's getting delayed. Blah blah blah. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Fast forward another 12 months, it gets launched on Game Pass, bunch of people playing it. It's an awesome game. I just finished it two days ago, nice. right? <laughs> you see the different paths that you can potentially take. And out of those two possibilities, right, that the delay and launch a better product is always going to be better with the exception that you have to take that short-term hit, right? Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because I actually have a story here because a buddy of mine, when uh, Call of Duty, I can't remember what it was, a couple of years ago, Call of Duty came out and they gave – PlayStation players an ex uh, exclusive whatever it was skin or something. One of my buddies on Xbox was like, "Oh, you know what? If I pay the same price as a PlayStation person, I should get the same things. I'm not buying it." Well, turns out he didn't buy it for six months, and then he's like, "Oh, you know, I really want to play it." He was giving himself that formula, so he basically punished himself by saying, "I'm not buying that game." To be honest, man, you know it's Call of Duty, right? They're not hurting if one or two people don't buy it, but it's fine. But anyway, uh, so the only person he hurt was himself, because at the end he ended up buying it anyway. And by the time he got into it, either everyone was really, really good, or you know his friends moved on and played other games. So he kind of hurt himself on that. But yeah, I, I uh, what are your thoughts like that? Like where it's like people have that mentality where it's like, oh, well, you know what? I'm gonna get back at you, the company. Uh, but really, they're they're not damaging the company. They're just hurting their own fun, I guess, or whatever it is. Uh, what kind of like a, a psyche is that about? What's that about? So that goes exactly to that point about like, if I expected I'd be playing alpha and making a profit and doing all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And that's not really the reality, right? Again, I've got two choices. I either go, my expectations were wrong, right? Or I say somebody else, you know, something external happened. They told me something that wasn't true or they did something. They must have known all that kind of stuff, right? So that's a sort of almost natural defense mechanism to say, um, you know, this is their fault so then they have to do something i deserve some sort of compensation or something like that that's where that that comes from right now in in fairness and i think um you guys talked about this well in the last episode right there is two sides to this sort of thing right if if people had expectations that says i was going to be playing alpha next month and making a big profit where did that expectation come from right, right. was that because they were saying things like the game's 80 percent done yeah. right which again to i like to wt's point from last episode i read that as like oh great like they're like polishing up some artwork and it's hmm. going to be in my hands right so i think that's the bit where companies with these innovations need to be uh super transparent that says this is where we are right and it's a fine balance of trying to keep the hype right keep people engaged keep people involved but not setting expectations right. that people say there's going to be 5 million users next month, right? You're all going to be rich, right? Cause that's also <laughs> not, it's not also not going to happen. Right. I'm right? okay with that outcome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. Bring yeah. it on. Bring it on. Yeah. You know, I have that. I, 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 that leads me a couple. Actually, I got a question for you. I got, I got another question too. So they, you know how they did this delay and stuff and then they did the snapshot taken. Now people's minds are just like, Pfft. And then it's like racing is like, okay. Well, it's not. And then now it's all, you know, uh, speculation and what is it going to be? And I see, I like, I, I know like when they do things like that, it brings excitement back in. It brings attention back in the project. I love that stuff. I love when they do that stuff. So what is the power of these random, you know, snapshot taken or random, like boom, uh, big bomb news like that. What's, what's the power of that? Yeah. So this is a, this is like classic psychology one oh one right? And it comes down to conditioning, right? Mm. Conditioning is about getting uh, people to sort of repeat behaviors, right? Do behaviors, right? So it's training, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one is one way of doing it is called classical conditioning, which is where you're just associating a behavior with something else that is desirable. And it's just always there, right? So there's this classic experiment 
Um, it's called Pavlov's Dogs. He rang a bell every time he feeds his dog, right? The dog then over time, whenever the bell goes, starts salivating because I'm getting fed now, right? So it's like every time this happens, right? This is something that You're happens, You're conditioned right? to it. You're conditioned to it, right? We're starting to see this interestingly with like Guild of Guardians where people are like, it's a Thursday and Ryan's typing. There must be a leak, right? It's sort of <laughs> the, that conditioning Two things being associated together over time, right? Sort of reinforces whatever that thing is. They're in the other kind. <laughs> right, they're literally salivating like, yeah. give me leaks, yeah. wet yeah. leaks, yeah. right? <laughs> the, the other kind is, is operant conditioning, right? Which is based on rewards and punishments, right? I reward this behavior, I punish this behavior, right? Now, with that operant conditioning, with those rewards and punishments, there's different ways you can do that, right? It can be can fixed or variable, and it can be based on time or it can be based on behavior right? So like a fixed behavior one would be every time you do this behavior, you get a reward, right? right. I'm t- trying to toilet train my son. Every time he uses the toilet, he gets a sticker, right? We're putting a sticker I- on a chart, classic like reward behavior. Like you get this every time you do that, right? Yeah, nice. And that's to build mm-hmm. an initial behavior, right? Mm-hmm. Over time, that becomes less motivating because if you get rewarded every time you do something, right, there's no real incentive to like go and do it now. It's like, well, I don't do it this yeah. time. Next time, I still get a sticker. What does right. it matter? Right? Like, why bother? Why put right. the effort in? Right? Mm-hmm. So, this is where the variable or random rewards become so powerful, right? So, random rewards, again, can be about like time or it can be about behavior, right? So, it could just be that every so often you just get rewarded. For something right random. and it's just a random amount of time now that's nice but it doesn't encourage you to do any kind of behavior right because you're just getting rewarded at random right so we know the most powerful sort of reward system at building long-term engagement and maintaining a behavior is these what we call the, the variable ratio random based on behavior right and this is exactly how um like casinos and slot Mm -hmm. machines are built right and i don't want to link so i should say this is not guild of guardians (laughs) is not running a casino right obviously (laughs) but that's why those things are so powerful because you put your money in you press the thing and you don't know if it's this time or in three times or 27 times when it's going to happen but it will happen at some point yeah that is hugely motivating to us as humans because our brains go what if it's next time Right? What if I just did one more and it was that one? How, or what if I walked away and then I saw the somebody else get it? Yeah. And then I, like, that's where FOMO comes back, right? Yeah. So that's why these random rewards, right? Which is why I loved this one because it was about, well, are we are assuming, right? A snapshot probably means you're holding something. They've got to take a snapshot of something, right? right? So the behavior here is like not selling, right? Yeah. Not just dumping all of your stuff because there was a delay right now they say it's coincidental timing we'll take them at face value it's very coincidental if there was a delay a bunch of people were selling and now you're going i'm taking a snapshot of st- who's still here right, right. that's you it know, encourages you to hold if it's a <laughs> absolutely right and because oh, yeah. they've done it a few times now right like honestly part of when i was like looking at guild of guns i'm like damn it why didn't i find this before december whatever it was when the avatars got got dropped, yep. right? Yep. You go, what if, like, I better buy today because what if tomorrow is the snapshot, <laughs> right? I'm, That's I, that random variable sort of behavior. Yeah. We don't I, know when it's going to happen, right? That's hugely yeah. motivating. Well, there's a running joke in here because I don't even own a profile picture. Mine is literally WTs. He's lending it to me and he's just like, he's such a good guy. He's like, dude, hold on to it. And I don't even know my own profile because just in case, what if the profile pictures give you, you know, alpha or a snap, but he was such a good man about it. He's like, dude, hold on to this. You could borrow it until you get your own. And I, I do got to, I have to get my own, man. This, uh, this poor guy probably wants his profile picture back. Nah, dude, I can't hang out with you if you're not in alpha with me. So, uh, yeah, it's, this is for selfish reasons. I gave it to you. Yeah, he's like, dude, you can't. Actually, I got to put it back on my profile. He's like, I can't hang out with you with your picture, not as a. I was like, all right, man. You know, geez. Hey, Dr. J, I got a question. Uh, you were talking about the casinos and stuff, and you were alluding to it earlier, too. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of this. Um, uh, this is what spurred me to look elsewhere outside of the old gaming industry. In fact, I'm on a quest to take down the old gaming industry because they ticked me off so bad. I didn't know it existed, and when I found out, it really it really ticked me off. They have copyrighted algorithms that are specifically made 
to like basically stalk human interaction. And even if you're a really good player, they figure out your tendencies on every click you do and how you do it. And then they, they throw in some like frustration mechanics to throw you off of like, you be, you could do something like a hundred times and then all of a sudden it's not working. And you're like, wait a minute, I did the same thing I've always done. And they do that to frustrate you, to get you to open up your wallet. And it's the same exact casino tactics. And uh, are, are you familiar with those kind of algorithms in that? I hadn't heard about those specific ones. I do know that within the gaming industry and within a lot of industries, there's so much time and effort spent on those sort of algorithms trying to turn to almost hack engagement, right? It's sort of like, well, I want you to stay around clicking on stuff as much as possible. We know this with social media, right? We know mm -hmm. that they know the more negative it is, the more sort of upset you get about it, the more time you spend on these sites, mm -hmm. right? Because you get right. that frustration like, oh, I've got to get this out, right? So I hang around, right? If you have too much of a good time, you're happy, you're content, you get satisfied, you go about your day, right? That's not what any of this sort of big, big companies want. They want you hanging around, right? And so the different kinds of engagement loops, right? The, the quickest way is like what you're talking about, frustrate people and they'll hang around, right? Longer term, you know, we know that going back to that idea of value, creating something that people value and they want to stay around and hang around is is much better. But definitely within gaming, like there's so much now, you know, some games here in Australia are having to put uh, warnings on them that essentially they involve gambling, right? Mm -hmm. They're essentially saying like, because, uh, you know, so I, I play, for example, NBA 2K, right? Like I'm a basketball fan. And one of their modes, this my team sort of thing, is where you can pay mm -hmm. with real money to get the virtual packs of your cards to get better players and do all this kind of stuff, right? Right. Which, look, some, some NFT card games have the similar ideas, except that people own the cards, right? That's, again, what's appealed to me where I go, these NFT games, right, are, 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 even if we talk about some of the, the play to win ones, are just using the same mechanics other games are using, except that the person then owns whatever right. that thing is and can trade right. it, right? right? All my players that I have in you know NBA 2K from getting the packs that I've earned and, and played for, I can't do anything with, right? Like they, they, yeah. I've got all these old versions of NBA 2K with all these players on them that I'll yep. never see again, right? That And that at its core is what actually really appealed to me about the whole NFT gaming space. It's like, well, if we're talking about playing games that I'm already playing and enjoying, but I then earn something or I own what I unlock, I'm in. Yep. Like that that's a win for me as a gamer. Yep. And that's the thing. A lot of like, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the game like Raid or Marvel Strike Force. These other games, what they do is in the gaming industry, they create a bottleneck that the only way to, to kind of get through it or, you know, or you're going to be grinding it for six months, throw a couple bucks at it. It'll kind of ease you through it. And that's kind of that mechanic that these games have is they give you a problem and then they sell you the solution to get through it. And then, you know, they're always giving you a problem that you have to buy your way through. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Now, speaking of like, you said you've been a gamer your whole life. I've been a gamer my whole life. I know WT is a beauty down there and he plays some games too. And, um, you know, I remember growing up like, it was a dream to be able to play video games and make money off it. Like that was like one of those things. It's like, Oh, one day, man, imagine you could, you know, play video games and make money. Um, and, and, you know, like we said, we're kind of, it's starting to get there, you know, where we own our assets where we're not just, you know, look at the game, like clash of clans. Like I, I know, people have spent thousands and thousands of dollars on clash of clans what does it get you nothing you know what i mean it's just it, literally nothing you don't own anything so um i think like these kind of uh where we're at now and, and uh, owning your assets and I, I you know it's amazing it's it's just uh i love it how we're getting there as a society again like i said you said you've been playing games your whole life i've been playing games my whole life and this is always one of my dreams and it's finally starting to come and i i'm, I'm here for it you know i'm definitely definitely here for it so yeah i like that you said uh, the random facts of this uh, or the snapshot uh, how it does that again, totally agree with it. It's like, uh, uh, there was another game I was involved with. Uh, what happened was, well, long story short, they got hacked. They got this big hack and, and a lot of problems happened. The person sold all their, their tokens or whatever. Okay. And then, uh, but the people said, listen for everybody. So they said, there's a snapshot taken and anybody that sold even one coin, even one coin was not eligible, but nobody knew that. Wow. So they said, if you sell That's one harsh. coin, that so it, what it does is it, it, what it basically does is say, listen, if you're really into this project and you believe in us, you're going to get rewarded. And they did. They rewarded everybody with a plot of land. So it's like, and now everything's kind of climbing back up, but it's like, they're mm -hmm. saying, listen, if you, if you believe in us, 
Uh, we're gonna re- we're gonna reward the people that are here for us and that are here as to build the community. And they did. They really rewarded people that stuck around. You sold one one of their token. You were not eligible for the snapshot, which was awesome. I mean, it sucks for people. I mean, uh, but I you know I I hold everything, man. You know, so I was like, all right, cool. Like, thank you. You know, but uh, anyway, yeah, I I love all the points you said. Like, this was so inch. I could talk to you all day. Like, this was I know. incredible. Uh, I literally could talk to you all day. Uh, this is, I'm just soaking Let's it all it in. Oh, I, listen, yeah. anytime you want to be here, you say the word and you're on. Uh, absolutely. WT, do you have any questions? Do you have anything you want to say? Anything oh. you want to add? I got like a million questions, but we don't have the time. So, uh, <laughs> I know, it's crazy. I'll, I'll, I'll end it on something light and funny, uh, or maybe not funny, but light. But uh, what's your uh, predictions on the snapshot? I... I'm very intrigued. I think the I think the people that are saying it's something to do with alpha, I think that does make sense because of the timings sort of add up. I'm sort of hoping that it's it's something to sort of what we're talking about of reward the people that stuck around. Mm-hmm. But again, my question is like, how do you do that without devaluing what already exists, right? Like you can't throw a bunch more right. of the same sort of avatars at people because then you've just sort of def- you know, right. diluted the market. Is it a pets sort of avatar? Something I don't know. That's um, I'm, I'm intrigued. Selfishly, I hope it's something like that because I'm, I'm, I'm like, well, I don't, I don't have an avatar. Uh, I'm, I have to look into it. But uh, you know, let's see. But definitely something to keep the community sort of engaged and feeling like the thing is moving along. That's what it, I think, needs to be. I agree. I think because are items in the game NFTs? They're NFTs, right? Items that are gonna be what if it's uh, like items? yeah items in the game but they're, they're gonna be NFTs right like say like your gear uh, and stuff yeah anything uh, rare epic or legendary right. is considered an NFT because uh, all the all the anything common is part of the game and not an NFT because I agree I, you they can't just throw more profile pictures because then it devalues the ones that are there it has to be something different so WT had a good point maybe it's the pets profile pictures something to do with pets which would be great what if it's like a, a special item in game or something like a special you know, uh, skin in your game that you could put on your armor or your shield or whatever. Give me that, it is. Give me that two-handed axe. Yeah, anything. You know, it could, I think it's it's gonna be something that, like you said, they can't do profile pictures again. They just can't, or it's just it's gonna make more of a problem than a solution. So, I mean, I just literally thought of this on the spot. What if it's like a, an in-game skin or something that you know, just you can add on to it, or uh, an item, or uh, like WT said, a pet skin or something, or a pet uh, profile picture. But it has to be something different. I agree. Or alpha. That's that's kind of like the the going around. Everyone thinks it's alpha. Uh, which is, you know, makes sense. WT, but I, was it, it was it was it you that was saying about uh, like quality of life stuff? I think I remember you talking about this maybe in the discords of saying like you're really into quality of life rewards, where it's like it makes the game be more fun, like sort of more convenient, but doesn't necessarily give you an advantage. Like it's not that you get a better hero or something; right. it's that you have a large inventory, or it's or you get a little right. sort of home base that you can do something um, with. Yeah, I'm, I'm real big on quality of life on like, you know, making the game like to where you're not like doing robot drone tasks all the time or you're having to spend crazy amounts of time to get something done to where you, you have to tie up your entire day to get it done. Uh, that's I'm a big fan of that. Uh, not all games really care about that, but some do. And I think Guild of Guardians does because I've heard them say that before that they didn't want people playing, you know, 12, 16 hours a day to do things. And I think they got it segmented like that. So. That's what I was talking about with quality of life. Which is which is a good thing because normally games they want you on there all day. That's that's their entire algorithm is how do they keep you playing? So it's nice that they're they're thinking like that because yeah, normally it's the opposite. It's like they want your attention, they want you on their game, on their app, well, on that's, their whatever. That's the whole gambling thing with casinos. They the longer you're there, the higher chance they have of you opening up your wallet. And that that really ticks me off, especially when you start factoring in that kids are gonna be playing this. And uh yeah, that that really bugs me. Yeah. Speaking of kids, I do hear mine waking up. Do your so thing. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to run pretty pretty My, soon. But um, hey, this has been super fun. Thanks, guys. I could listen to you all day. We can actually. We can. We can. You know what? We can end this right here. Uh, it was. It's an hour long, which is amazing. I mean, this was absolutely phenomenal. Do you want to do any closing? I'm gonna put all your socials. I want you to send me all your socials. I'll put it all in the description and everything. We want to get you out to your podcast. You do a podcast. Tell us. Give us. Give us. Uh, close it up. Close it up. Tell us about yourself. Yeah. How you want to close yeah. it. Come Go find me. Come find me. So on Twitter uh, at Dr. J Retail, right? Because that's sort of my day job is is doing research on on retail stuff. 
Uh, the podcast is called Shopology. It's sort of essentially consumer behavior, consumer psychology, again, around uh, sort of mostly retail consumer marketing. Um, I interview sort of leading practitioners and then we sort of go back and forward a bit from my sort of academic space. I throw some big questions at them. We sort of try and hash out what that means in the real world. Uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so yeah, come, come, come hang out. I'll definitely be checking it out 100%. I love this. So thank you again uh, for being here. We'll definitely have to get you on again. This was, there's, like I said, we could do 10 of these easily. I mean, I, I just want to keep listening. I don't even, you know what I mean? Amazing. WT, anything you want to say closing up? Anything you want to add in? Nah, uh, thanks a lot for this, uh, Dr. J. It was awesome. Thank I loved uh, listening to you speak. Very cool stuff. Can't wait to do it again. And let's go. Let's go. Let's All go. right, you beauties. All right. Thank you, everybody that's Take watching. It's still here. Uh, I will talk to you guys soon. All right, guys. Thank you so much again, Dr. J. WT, you're an absolute beauty. I'm out of here. Peace.